Our lesson for today is Choose Life. It is lesson number nine out of unit three, Life on God's Terms. And this is from our study manual, Faith Pathway, Bible Studies for Adults. Our lesson's devotional reading is 2 Corinthians, the fifth chapter, verses 17 through 21. Our background scripture is Romans 6. Our printed passage is Romans 6, verses 1 through 4, 12 through 14, and 20 through 23. Our lesson's aims uh, for Lesson 9, Choose Life, are recall Paul's explanation that one's accepting Jesus frees him or her from sin while binding him or her to righteousness to gain eternity. Connect being baptized into Christ with giving up sin and renewing creation. And our last lesson aim is renew your baptismal commitment. Our key verse for today's lesson study is Romans, the sixth chapter and the fourth verse. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Since our lesson is titled, Choose Life, it uh, begins by identifying things that would be impediments or things that would hinder the process of the new life uh, reigning in our persons. Uh, so as we look at um, our lesson today, uh, one of the first things that of course is listed uh, is out of Romans, uh, the sixth chapter, and it begins at the first verse, and it reposes what uh, some have uh, commented to be like a rhetorical question. Uh, but Paul raises this and says, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? So as the question is proposed to us, it raises this thought, and that is that simply because uh, we teach and acknowledge and we also accept that we are uh, being afforded the grace of God, and because of that, then it should not be something that is misused or taken advantage of or something that is not given the respect and value that it deserves. So here, because it had been taught that the believer, the new believers would not be uh, utterly uh, cast down or punished uh, because of their transgressions. Uh, well, then at the same time, it should not be understood that that means that I can go about doing whatever I choose because no matter what I do, I'm going to be forgiven for it anyway. So Paul really uses a strong uh, tone in his voice when he says, by no means, and then continues with that by saying, we died to sin. So how can we live in it any longer? Uh, when we look at what unrighteous behavior does to us in our personal lives, when we actually uh, stack the, uh, 
the experiences that we've uh, encountered, uh, the things that we have actually uh, experienced through the choices that we've made in life. When we put those experiences, good and bad, on a scale and begin to look at the balance between the two, it is no secret which one is the heaviness or the heavier in our choices. So as we look at this, um, one uh, recognizes and one of the commentaries uh, says anyone who would argue that continuation of sin is a good thing because it results in more opportunities for God to forgive us has missed the point entirely. And uh, sometimes it appears as people are keeping a list and uh, they're trying to uh, look to see how many more opportunities do I have for forgiveness uh, as though I've got 17 more chances out there or I've got 23 more that I can do. Um, the question was uh, lifted uh, for those who uh, sometimes their behavior seems as though they have a tally or a list that they're trying to uh, see how many more opportunities. Uh, but Peter proposed a question to Christ, um, and this is recorded in the uh, 17th chapter of Luke. Uh, and uh, he asked the question that if his brother sinned against him, um, how many times should he forgive him? And uh, Christ answered him by saying that you rebuke him, which simply means that you reprimand him, you correct him. And the key part here is if he repents, then forgive him. And uh, in Matthew, I believe it's in the uh, 18th chapter in Matthew, uh, verse uh, 22, because Peter raised the question, how many times? And he said, seven times in a day. Uh, and then he said, well, seven times seven. Uh, and then in uh, Luke uh, 22, uh, Christ says, 70 times seven. And uh as um, I guess immature as it may appear, uh, but some people use those uh, methods of teaching a lesson on forgiveness as a uh, numerical system of how to tally up how many times I can be forgiven. Uh, but the key point here is, is that if the brother or the sister repents. And if they repent, that is not to repeat, but that is to turn away from whatever wrong it is that you've committed. So it's not that um, I can uh, be forgiven as many times uh, as the Lord has spoken for the same offense, but when I recognize, and here comes the part about the, rebu the rebuke, is the correction, is to um, reprimand someone, to uh, enlighten someone to what their error is. Uh, and then if they repent, if they turn from those ways, well then forgiveness is afforded to them. But if you are already establishing a list and you're just trying to see how many times you can push the envelope, then your intent is not to correct yourself. Your intent is to continue to do as you choose, make whatever choices you choose, without the consequences thereof. The grace, uh, which is a gift of, from God that is given unto us is not a license to sin. Uh, the commentary raises a very good question here, and it says that the very nature of the justified, reconciled, and that's those that are believers, that life is, is that sin becomes 
a stranger to us and it is no longer a friend to us. And then it lifts a very good point here. It says the unsafe person sins by appointment and that is they choose to sin. The saved person sins by accident. It is a mistake and they repent for what they've done and they try and correct themselves. Um, the verse three and four also lifts another um, thought for us to reflect upon uh, as we talk about should we continue in sin? Should we just take advantage of this? And that is, it says to us that don't you know that we were all baptized into Christ? Those of us that were baptized into Christ were also baptized into his death. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Now, in the practice of our baptism, um, in our uh, practice of this ordinance, uh, when we go down under the water and we do a full submersion as though we are fully covered and dead, we usually have those candidates to fold their arms in front of them as though they were actually in a casket. And when we go down, it symbolizes that death, that sin, that that life of choices that are against the will and desire of God for us, that those things are going underwater also. Those things are being buried also. And as Christ became a sacrifice, a sin offering for the sins of the world and died, and then God raised him to new life after he sacrificed for the sins of the world, then the same thing should happen to us when we go through the process symbolizing that we are dying to the desires of ourselves, that we are now entering into the new life with Christ. Therefore, we have killed those things that are obstacles and those things that are in the way of living unto righteousness. Now, of course, we will still stumble. We will have problems. Uh, we will make mistakes, but those will be earnest and sincere mistakes. They won't be planned and plotted. Now, our background scripture, which is in 2 Corinthians, the 5th chapter, uh, at the 17th verse, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. As we look at this, because our lesson is focusing on the behavior of the justified and those who have been reconciled. In the 19th verse, it says, that is, that God was in Christ. God took the personage of Christ to reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trans, uh, trespasses to them, not blaming them for their trespasses, not bringing up their past to them, but it says, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. So God is not like we are. We like to bring up the past and keep reminding ourselves about 
what you used to do and I remember you when and you haven't changed. I know you still got it. I know you still like that. And so we don't like to expound upon the newness of life. And that becomes a hindrance, not uh, unto God, because God has done the work and made the way for us to receive it. It becomes an obstacle and a hindrance for us. We deny ourselves the better life that we could have by constantly dwelling in the past. Remember, the text said that we are a new creature. That old things have passed away. Behold, all things are new. Now, Paul doesn't stop here, though. He continues. He said, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. And let's let's talk about that for just a minute here. Uh, when we say something reigns, we're talking about a period in time where uh, a certain element or a certain behavior uh, has the ability to uh, exist in our lives. And it becomes the thing that governs us. So it's like an evil ruler, a tyrant uh, in the text is used to describe this type of uh, leadership uh, or this type of uh, governance. Uh, and so it mentions reign like kings that reign over a period of time. And then history records to us what happened during their time of reign. Here it says, don't let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its evil desires. Now, it goes on to tell us that it is true in our commentary. It says it is true that our flesh is weak. However, God's indwelling presence in us gives us the power to overcome temptation. Now, I want to look at another passage of scripture right there. Uh, where we speak about the flesh being weak, because a lot of times we constantly use that as an excuse uh, for the mistakes and sometimes the pitfalls we find ourselves in. But uh, let's look at Hebrews, the fourth chapter, uh, as we look at what it tells us in the 15th verse. Here it says, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. So that removes the excuse of saying that, well, uh, there was no one I could explain this to. You know how people in position of authority are. You know, they're, they're like very, you know, hard and, and they are not, you know, reasonable and, uh, you know, they're, they're quick to make judgments and, you know, inflict whatever the punishment is. Uh, so, but here in Hebrews 4.15, it says, we don't have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness, with our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we were, yet without sin. It goes on to tell us, Therefore, let us come boldly before the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So, we don't have to be shameful and and say, well, uh, I made this mistake and I know God is tired of hearing about it. And so, uh, again, let us remember now, if we are sincerely and earnestly repenting of the things that we do. But if in the back of our mind, tucked away, we seriously or just saying, I'm going to keep on going through the process. I'm going to keep on uh, pretending as though I am serious about trying to stop doing this. But really deep down inside, I know I'm planning on doing it again tomorrow. Then 
Don't look for the benefit of going before God and on bended heart, really looking for him to empower you to overcome these things. Now, when we speak about the empowering part, that element, we also want to bring this up. First Corinthians 10 and 13. Because sometimes uh, we convince ourselves that um, this this issue, this kind of uh, snuck up on me. I was unaware. But the scripture in 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, No temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. Meaning that we are aware of all of the pitfalls as they present themselves. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. God is who? God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Now, does that remove all of our excuses and all of our complaining? Uh, if not, then I also want to bring you over to the book of James. James, first chapter, I'm going to start it at the 12th verse, says, Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life. We're talking about choose life. He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Now, the scripture here is making it very clear that uh, we are not just helpless, uh, uninformed individuals just stumbling around in the dark, but the text is making it very clear that we know the difference between good and bad. And our commentary says this, it really comes down to our willpower. God never forces anyone to do anything. He allows us to make our own decisions, whether to good or bad. Now, when we begin to talk about sin reigning in our mortal bodies. It says, don't offer parts of your body to sin as instruments of wickedness, but rather, rather offer yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and offer the parts of their body to him as instruments of righteousness, not instruments of wickedness. For sin shall not be your master because you are not under the law, but under grace. There again, uh, we have to recognize that when we went through that process of baptism, that uh, that said that we would no longer allow wickedness and evil and sin and transgression to be the master of our lives, but we would now turn over a new leaf. And just like we followed those things of the past, we will now usher ourselves in as ambassadors of righteousness. Now, again, when we look at this, it says in actuality, we will not be sinless, but we will sin less. We will still have some mistakes. There are still some things for us to get over. But the process here is, is that we are moving towards 
righteousness. Our focus is not on what we can get away with, but our focus is on what God wants us to become. So as we look at the end of our lesson here, this really brings things uh, uh, straightforward. Uh, verses 20 through 23. And it tells us clearly, uh, when we were slaves to sin, we were free from the control of righteousness. Now, now isn't that an irony there? A lot of times uh, we become so entangled and, and so imprisoned uh, to sin that there's no room for us to practice righteousness. The irony of that is, is that... Uh, Sometimes we believe that you can't be or you it's impossible for us to live into righteousness free from sin. Yet the same person, the same mind, the same heart, the same capabilities, the same uh, elements that are present in the person while they're sinning to be free from righteousness now, sin we can do without any involvement of righteousness, but it's, it's as though it's an impossibility for us to be righteous, but be free from sin. But it's okay for us to be sinful and have no presence of righteousness. So it says, what benefit did we reap at the time from the things you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. When we were slaves to sin, what things were we doing at that time that we were very proud of? We wanted printed in the newspaper. We wanted it announced on the mountaintops. We wanted it viewed uh, on the TV screens. What things were we practicing while we were in sin that we were so proud of? It says, but now... That you have been set free from sin. You have become servants to God. Now in the text it uses the term slaves and it uses the term servants. But uh, as we look at this, God is not interested in having slaves. But God is interested in having servants. So as we... Uh, Read over our text as we uh, look at the advantages of it. I would like to leave uh, this commentary, uh, which says, uh, while master sin pays wages in the form of death, our loving master God gives us the gift of eternal life. Now, the end text, verse 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Just remember, we have been empowered. And just as we can take our same being and do all manners of evil, we also can take this same being, which is God's creation, for it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We can take this same being and then serve God unto righteousness as we were slaves unto sin, unto wickedness. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.